right, we're going to go ahead and kick things off. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for tuning into this R Street webinar on agriculture policy for the 21st century. My name is Caroline Kitchens. I'm R Street's Director of Government Affairs. Um, I'm joined here by two of my esteemed colleagues. First, we have Clark Packard, who is um, R Street's Trade Policy Council, and he's our expert on all things related to finance, insurance, and trade policy. Thanks, Clark, for being here. Thanks. And second, we have Jonathan Bidlack. He's R Street's Director of the Fiscal and Budget Policy Project, and he's a resident senior fellow. He's also the creator of SpendingTracker.org, which is a site that tracks federal spending in real time and is a really great resource, especially for our friends on the Hill. So I'm going to keep this to a pretty informal conversation. We'll jump right into discussion because I know this is a big topic to cover. Um, I will say if you have any questions at any point, you should have along the right hand side a Q&A box. Just drop the questions in there. We'll try to get to them. You can also feel free to use the chat box to chat amongst yourselves, um, but it's probably best to put it in the Q&A feature if you'd like to ask the panel a question. So I guess I'll just kick things over to Clark first. Um, Clark, can you give us, I guess, the big picture? How is the agriculture economy faring in 2020? Um, and how did we get here? Well, first of all, thanks for, for putting this together. Um, I think the, the most important thing to understand right now is the overall economy is fairly soft because of COVID. Uh, but even before COVID, sort of the outbreak of COVID, uh, the last few years have been pretty tough for the US agriculture industry. Um, if, if you go back to 2017, when the president was first sworn in, one of his first initial acts was to withdraw the United States from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which was a uh, promising trade pact that uh, President Obama had negotiated that was essentially going to open up a bunch of closed foreign markets, particularly in the Asian, uh, Asian Pacific region. Um, so that would have been a tremendous boom to, to the U.S. domestic agriculture industry. He, fo he followed that up with a number of other fairly uh, destructive actions in terms of threatening to withdraw from NAFTA, North American Free Trade Agreement. Um, there were, he engaged in heavy trade wars with China and the rest of the world over national security tariffs. Uh, and then last year, uh, the crop, uh, the ag industry was hit by heavy flooding. Um, so just last year, for example, uh, exports to China of agriculture products were down about 20%. Flooding prevented about 20 million acres of cropland from being planted, and then farm bankruptcies uh, from a combination of both uh, were up by about 25%. So all in all, uh, I think it's it's safe to say that it's been a tough couple years for the ag industry. And you know, you you add on COVID, and and I think it really is kind of a tough situation. Um, on the bright side for the ag industry, you know, uh, certain. Producers benefited tremendously from the passage of the 2018 Farm Bill, uh, which passed in late December of 2018. Um, but I just put out a, a paper kind of detailing all of this, and I'm sure we'll get into more of the specifics. Yeah, it's a great paper, and I'll put it in the chat box in case any of you missed it. Um, Jonathan, let's turn to you. Obviously, you're our expert on all things fiscal policy. Um, can you give us some perspective on the fiscal outlook in the ag sector? So how much are taxpayers spending to support farmers and are our programs working? Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a loaded question. As we know, ag spending is a pretty significant part of the federal budget. Um, so when we talk about this, I mean, it's best to start, I guess, with the farm bill, right? The farm bill uh, was last uh, reauthorized in 2000, uh, 2018. Um, and I think the CBO estimate from that, uh, that farm bill was about $900 billion, uh, billion dollars over 10 years, so about $90 billion a year on, on average. Um, now, of course, COVID, as, as you know, Clark just mentioned, happened. And so um, a number, pretty much all sectors of the economy have been impacted in one way or another. And we've had relief efforts that have um, you know, given uh, aid to individuals and to businesses and to state and local governments. Um, and the farm uh, sort of sector has been part of that or has been a, a recipient. Um, the, so, so if you kind of maybe take a step back for a second, um, you know, one of the things that uh, Clark mentions in his, in his paper um, is sort of the workaround that was being used by the federal government to address some of the harms that were being imposed by 
um, the tariffs and other sort of um, restrictions on trade that, that predated the current COVID crisis. And so um, the CCC, which is a sort of legacy program of the New Deal, uh, was used as a conduit to provide aid to farmers um, and to, you know, farm, large uh, farm agribusiness um, to sort of uh, nominally uh, compensate them for the harms that were being had, you know, in terms of not being able to, for example, access um, certain foreign markets. And so when COVID hit, uh, there was sort of this realization that, well, we can, you know, the farm bill happens every five years, reauthorized every five years. We're not right at that point in the cycle. So we need some sort of conduit to uh, provide aid to farmers in the current climate. Why don't we just use the same mechanism we were using uh, in the trade context? And so the CARES Act uh, basically re uh, authorized an additional $14 billion in aid on top of $16 billion that had already previously been authorized. And so um, now we essentially gave the Secretary of Agriculture the ability to spend up to $30 billion to farmers. And so um, that has essentially been what's happened. Um, now, depending on who you ask, um, you know, whether or not that is enough or not enough is sort of an open question. And unsurprisingly, um, you know, some of the large businesses that have been the recipients of that aid would argue that it is not enough. And they'll point to, um, you know, just a decline in, uh, in farm incomes and, um, and so, you know, and basically, I, in some cases, arguing that they need, you know, something like on the order of $50 billion. And so there have, and we can talk more about this, just some of the attempts and things that are on the horizon. And so um, now that ignores uh, the component of, uh, you know, in the value of their inventories, which has actually risen to a large degree and has to a significant uh, degree offset some of the declines in expected revenues that they uh, that they were facing. So um, I think the, the case is actually pretty strong that we, when you include the aid that they've already received, um, it may not be necessary to, uh, at least in the immediate term, provide additional aid to compensate you know, as, as a form of compensation um, for, for lost revenue. So, um, so, you know, the picture going forward is not always great. I think the best, obviously, the, 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 the biggest determination of whether that, that picture uh, looking forward will be positive for the ag industry is going to be that question of access to foreign markets. Um, and, you know, there's just a lot of uncertainty right now, given COVID, we don't know how long this is going to last that has implications for, um, you know, people eating out in restaurants, which then, re you know, reduces demand for food and so on and so forth. So there's all these kinds of different, you know, effects that are very difficult to, um, to disaggregate. But, um, you know, I would say that, you know, obviously, uh, markets don't like uncertainty. And the big problem with COVID, generally speaking, is that it injects uncertainty and uh, and that's that's a, a, just as much a problem for the agricultural sector as it is for any any other sector of the economy. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So I think a lot of people who are maybe new to ag policy are used to thinking that the farm bill is, you know, the be all and end all for farm support. That that's how we provide support to farmers. But as we've seen in the last couple of years, now we have the market facilitation payments. Um, we have additional coronavirus related aid. Um, and so we'll turn to some of those things a li little later, but let's first just talk about the farm bill. So um, either of you, whoever, whoever wants can take this one, but can you just kind of walk us through um, how the farm bill supports farmers and what types of programs are used th reauthorized through the farm bill? Yeah, I, I, can, I can tackle that. Um, I, the farm bill is made up of a ton of different titles that touch on a number of uh, issues, but when we think about the farm safety net, um, and that's sort of the focus of my paper. Um, most people would, would tend to think of three programs specific to, to the farm safety net. First is the federal crop insurance program, which provides coverage against loss of crop yields from drought, uh, excessive moisture, freeze, various diseases. Um, it's the largest, most expensive component of the farm safety net. Um, there are 100 crops that are eligible, about 100 crops that are eligible. Um, provides up to a, about $100 billion worth of coverage um, on almost 250 million acres across the United States. Uh, taxpayers cover about 60 to 65 percent of insurance premiums for that, um, and farmers choose from, I think it's 15 to 20 various uh, private insurance companies that provide the product. Um, but the top 10 subsidy recipients of, of the program receive about 77 to 80 percent of, of the overall farm subsidies. Um, the top 1 percent of the recipients receive about 25 percent of all the subsidies. So in other words, this program tends to benefit uh, large, fair, fairly wealthy 
uh, agri corporations, and it's not exactly what we have in mind when we think of small, austere uh, mom and pop sort of farms and ranches. Um, the, the second program, and I should add that farmers are eligible for both crop insurance and either what's known as agriculture risk coverage or price loss coverage. Um, and so the other component of this is, is the agriculture risk coverage. Uh, that was created in the 2014 Farm Bill and then reauthorized in 2018. Um, and again, farmers can utilize either, can utilize ARC, uh, even if they also collect crop insurance subsidies. Uh, but the program basically pays for farmers if their revenue per acre, or if the county in which the farm is located, uh, the revenue per acre falls below a certain benchmark or guaranteed level, they get a payout. Um, Payouts are subject to $125,000 per person per year limits, although there are ways that uh, major corporations sort of skirt around that, and that's something that we've worked on. Um, there's also what's known as price loss coverage, uh, which was also established in the 2014 Farm Bill, reauthorized in 2018. Uh, the program is pays subsidies when the effective rate of a covered commodity is less than the reference price set by Congress. Um, for that commodity. And then in the 2018 Farm Bill, uh, included, there, included in that was what was known as a, an escalator provision uh, that raises the commodities, the covered commodities effective reference price um, to as much as 115% of the statutory price loss coverage price. So, um, and, and similar to ARC, it has a $125,000 per person per year limit. Uh, and I can, I can kind of defer to to Jonathan on, on sort of the costs of these programs. But yeah, I think, I think it's safe to say that, again, our idea, people's idea that these, these programs tend to benefit small sort of struggling mom and pop shops is just not true. It, it's just unequivocally the case that, that the overall benefit, the largest beneficiaries tend to be the largest uh, agri corporations that we you know, have in the back of our mind. Yeah, and I'll just piggyback on that for a second. I mean, and I think that that makes sense, right? I mean, we see this phenomenon in a whole number of areas of government spending. I mean, the 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 people, the businesses that are the most well connected are going to be able to have undue influence to ensure that those programs are set up in such a way to benefit them more relative to other people. And and I think um, you know it's important to I mean. You know, being a farmer in today's economy is arguably one of the hardest and most sophisticated jobs that, that there is, right? There's a, um, the, the knowledge of how markets work and, and being able to account for market risk is incredibly important in the agricultural sector. Um, and so, you know, there are, I, I think it's somewhat unfortunate, right, that we have these programs where the bulk of the cost is going to um, those businesses that already have advantages over the little guy, in a sense, um, that they are able to exploit in the in the marketplace, uh, and on top of that, you know, they are they're they're getting these sort of benefits. The other thing I'll say is that um, you know, and this is again also a problem I think with a lot of government spending. I mean, I, I spend a lot of time talking about duplication, and you know, what Clark just talked about is really a great example of duplicative spending, where we have multiple programs. Uh, that are that are set up, um, any of which theoretically can make sense, but what really doesn't make sense is the ability to to, to double dip within those different programs. Um, and you know that's a problem with you know government waste generally. I think people have this this notion that um, you know government waste is just sort of the fat at the end of the steak, and if we can just go and trim off the the fat, we're going to end up being left with the with the steak that we want. And you know the reality is oftentimes it's just much more marbled in. Um, and so when we talk about these programs, um, you know, it's uh, it, it, we need to think about them in terms of you know how do we how do we structure them in a way so that we don't have that waste being being marbled in. And I think the big problem with with some of the spending and the programs that are authorized via the Farm Bill is that you know they've been set up in a way so that you know this this you know quote proverbial you know waste is. Is marbled into the system, and it's almost by design. And that's, uh, you know, that's what makes these issues, I think, very tricky to work on. Is that it's not just as simple as saying, you know, oh, this program is bad, let's get rid of it. Um, there's some of that, uh, but a, a lot of it is, uh, is you know, this marbled in problem. So the last farm bill was reauthorized in 2018. Uh, we'll be coming up 
pretty soon. I hate to say it's crazy how fast time has gone, um, but we'll be coming up pretty soon on probably another farm bill. Are there any like reforms that you guys would like to see that would help, in your opinion, right size the farm safety net and address some of these issues with the largest farms reaping most of the benefits? Jonathan, I'll. Yeah, I'll say I'll say a couple things. I mean, I mean, look, anytime you have a subsidy, um, it's going to distort the marketplace, uh, and so. Um, you know, that's not to say that there isn't an intellectual case for subsidies, of course. Of course, um, and so I think it's important to to really try to keep those those market distortions to a minimum. Um, and I think right now we have a system that we have been, you know, we've been moving toward increased spending in this area rather than uh, you know imposing a budget constraint, I guess. And so. Um, so I think generally speaking, you know, what I would like to see is just, uh, you know, getting rid of some of this double dipping um, and keeping, keeping the aid as relief uh, rather than what borders on, frankly, as a corporate welfare system. Um, and so I think, you know, again, there's a, um, you know, we can all sort of debate about, you know, the, the degree to which there should or should not be a, a safety net and what that should look like. Um, but there's also this, I, I think where we should, we should all agree is that there really shouldn't be, we shouldn't be using a system that is meant to be, um, you know, relief for those who are struggling as a way of funneling money toward, uh, you know, large businesses that don't need it. And so, um, you know, that's where I think the, the biggest area of reform be. So things like, you know, again, reducing double dipping, reducing the thresholds that are, um, that are necessary or, or, you know, to be able to qualify for some of this, uh, some of this funding. I think is is a must, and then obviously in the, in the on the trade front, the other the other big component here is um, is and this is you know maybe separate from the farm bill question, but it's really uh, you know prioritizing the opening up of, of foreign markets. I think is also a critical component because because essentially the trade off that we have right now is you know we are the the, the federal government is imposing hardships on the agricultural sector, which is already having hardships imposed on it for reasons totally unrelated to their own business decisions, things like COVID, for example. Um, and so, you know, in my perspective the, the federal, is that the federal government should not be an obstacle in the way they should be trying to go and get rid of some of the, um, the obstacles that already, that already exist. And, uh, you know, unfortunately that hasn't really been the path that we've been on in some of the recent, um, you know, farm bill negotiations. Yeah, I, I would add uh, a couple concrete ideas. Um, Caroline, this is something that you and I have worked on. Uh, but, uh, you know, like I, I was mentioning that uh, under ARC and PLC that, that you know, it's $125,000 per year per person uh, limit, but corporations that own major farms are able to sort of skirt around that. I know Chairman, or I guess, uh, Senator Grassley has, has proposed these ideas of capping that in, in a way that prevents um, people from setting up like a corporation that can qualify uh, and having uh, a farm be owned by multiple people. And that allows them to, to essentially, uh, like Jonathan was mentioning, uh, double dip um, and, and sort of get around what was ostensibly a, a well-intentioned idea that, look, you, it's $125,000 per person per limit or per year uh, cap and, and you know corporations are, are fairly sophisticated and they're able to, to skirt around that by using corporate entities and, and stuff like that so I think I think that's a good idea um, I'll get maybe a little wonky um, but at the WTO the the United States at the World Trade Organization has what are subsidies are based on on sort of a, a traffic light system red orange uh, green um, and so what are known as sort of amber box subsidies uh, or red box subsidies that are, that are prohibited or the U.S. The US uh, back in 1995 uh, basically said we're going to cap our most trade distorting subsidies at $19 billion a year. Um, and, you know, we've been under that. It's typically right about five to six billion dollars a year. Um, but these COVID payment, uh, excuse me, the trade facilitation payments, and then on top of that, the potential uh, COVID payments are raising Clark, Did he lose froze Clark? for a second. <laughs> we potentially buy, I, I'm sorry. Back. You're back. You froze for a second. But okay. 
Um, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I was saying that, look, the United States committed itself to, to a maximum of, of about $20 billion a year of what are known as the most trade distorting subsidies. Um, and right now, the United States spends about $5 billion, but that was kind of before the trade facilitation payments or market facilitation payments uh, and, and the COVID payments. And so countries are starting to ask a lot of questions um, about whether or not these measures are consistent with our WTO obligations. And if they're not, then other countries can then file a, a dispute at, at the WTO and potentially target more uh, ag products for retali foreign retaliation. Um, and so I would just, I, I would urge policymakers to, to take that commitment seriously and to try to keep uh, the, the annual subsidy below that $20 billion threshold for trade distorting subsidies. I think that that would be a really good step. Um, it, it would help long term our potential to open up foreign markets. Um, but, but again, this, is, this isn't, it shouldn't be controversial. The United States made its commitment um, and kept its word uh, for 25 years. It's just been in the last couple of years where we've arguably uh, exceeded that threshold. So my hope is that as, as policymakers think through what the next farm bill would look like, they would take that, that commitment seriously. Thank you. And I also want to point out that Scott Faber from the Environmental Working Group dropped some great resources in the chat box. I definitely encourage everyone to check those out. Um, crop insurance payments are not transparent. And EWG has done a really great job FOIAing those and getting the best data we can on who gets crop insurance payments um, and the problems that arise from that. Uh, so check that out. Um, I guess I wanna drill a little more down on the trade issue. So obviously Congress passed nearly a trillion dollar farm bill over 10 years, um, which you, know, you would have assumed would be a pretty generous farm safety net. Um, but then just a couple years later, we saw the administration revive the Commodity Credit Corporation to send additional payments to farmers who were impacted by loss of markets due to the trade war. Um, Jonathan, I guess my question for you, I know you do a lot of work on Article I issues, is I guess just how could they do this? Um, you know, this is money that wasn't authorized by Congress. Shouldn't Congress have had a role to play in this? Yeah, um, well, I mean, the money to some degree has, authorized, has been authorized, right? So there was, um, you know, there was, as I mentioned earlier, there was, I think it was $16 billion that was authorized for the CCC, um, which the CARES Act then increased by an additional $14 billion. So essentially there was $30 billion of, of wiggle room in here. Um, the, uh, so, so, you know, it, again, I, I, think, I think policymakers have seized on the CCC as sort of a, um, a vehicle for additional uh, spending. Um, obviously, on top of that, there are now, you know, put, uh, even further pushes to, uh, you know, provide, I think it's an, up to an additional 40 or $50 billion in further supplemental appropriations. Um, and I think there's even one, one proposal out there, uh, Clark can correct me if I'm wrong, to, to, to pr make the uh, funding for the CCC permanent. Um, and giving the the Secretary of Agriculture the ability to permanently go and um, and direct spending and this is problematic um, from a number of fronts so one is just the budgetary front right there's a question of um, you know it, it does this money make sense if it makes sense right now that's one thing but is it going to make sense three or five or you know however many years from now in the in a post covid environment and now you've basically just permanently expanded government by allowing a new vehicle um, that's uh, you know, for, for providing this kind of aid. So there's, there's the, the budgetary concerns. Then there's also just a separation of, of powers concern. I mean, to the degree that, um, you know, Congress is basically saying, hey, you know, executive branch, you just decide how to direct this funding. You know, that is, um, you know, maybe it's not quite a formal violation of, of, you know, Congress's power over the purse, but this is a problem that we've seen generally speaking in, in many areas of government where, you know, Congress will go and, and, you know, hand over a pot of money, and then the executive branch takes a lot of actions that's effectively, you know, law. Um, it's, a, you know, by deciding that we're going to give this funding to this particular um, entity or this particular state, um, you know, it's essentially ceding that, um, that Article One authority to the executive branch. And that's problematic from the standpoint of, of continued oversight. So it creates situations where, for example, um, you know, if you talk about some of the distribution of aid that we've seen from the CCC recently, um, it's gone much more heavily to Midwestern farmers, for example, rather than Southern farmers. Um, and you might ask yourself, you know, 
I'll sort of leave it up to the listeners, but you know, are there potential political considerations at play that might be causing the aid to be directed in that way? Because uh, you know, there are plenty of farmers in the South, I think, who are very much uh, uh, struggling as well. And we've seen the aid be distributed in a, fas in a fashion um, that isn't really proportional to the hardship that's been faced. And so now we end up in a situation where it's very difficult for Congress to exercise adequate oversight because they've already ceded that power to the executive branch. And so, um, you know, again, that's, a, um, that's why things like permanent authorizations, I think, are very problematic um, because, first of all, you know, they take a temporary program and they make it permanent and, and the problem that it was originally meant to address may not be permanent. I mean, the CCC itself, you know, for anyone who's watched Ken Burns' documentary on the Dust Bowl, I always say it's, the, it's one of the best things you can watch to understand modern agriculture policy because so much of the ag policy that we're dealing with today was really set up to solve a problem that was a legitimate problem in the 1930s that by and large doesn't exist or doesn't exist to the degree or, uh, or in, the, in kind, you know, to, to what it was back then. Um, but our sort of our whole agriculture age structure at the federal level is, is still fighting the problems of the Dust Bowl. Um, and I think, you know, the CCC is a great example of that. It was literally, you know, started in 1933, re-upped in 1948 and has sort of continued ever since and now has been sort of revamped in the last few years. Um, but that's really, if, you're, if you want to see accountable government, that's probably not the way you want things to be structured. Um, and it's, and, you know, it creates a whole host of, a whole host of problems. Yeah, I, I would, I completely agree with that. I, I think the biggest concern that I have, and it's something that we've talked about internally, is does this, do these payments become sort of permanent and part of the baseline? Um, and again, just from a trade angle, these are tend to be fairly trade distorting subsidies that violate our commitments at the WTO. Um, but, but, you know, beyond that, I, again, I think that the United States had made some progress on sort of starting to pare back some of the most egregious agriculture practices. Um, but just the last couple of years, we've completely unwound that, right? Um, and maybe this, these sort of quasi bailout payments made sense if, if you think, um, and I, I tend to, to agree with this criticism, that, that the United States um, has very legitimate complaints about certain trade policy practices that China in particular engages in. Um, and so maybe this system was worthwhile if it were able, if it were successful in disciplining China to change its intellectual property rights protections and force technology transfer. But mm -hmm. our, the initial sort of um, score on, on that front are, are is not positive. Um, that, that essentially China, it's, status quo, sort of same intellectual property abuses, forced technology transfer. Um, and now we've just layered on this, this massive program um, that, you know, is, is bailing out people that were unwitting uh, sort of soldiers in this trade war, right? The, the farm industry didn't want a trade war. Um, they knew that the, the largest exports to China tend to be ag products, and they knew that politically they would be the target of this. And so, um, you know, at some level, I feel bad for them. Um, but but this, this situation, it's not resolving itself. The, the United States has, has forced China, China agreed to, to buy um, X number of dollars of certain products. And there are a whole host of trade problems with that getting in from sort of a free trade uh, paradigm into a managed trade uh, paradigm. But irrespective of that, it, it, it just, it's not effective. China has not changed its policies. And so we've caught these unwitting participants in a crossfire and it's gonna become potentially become part of the new baseline going forward. And it, it, it's really tough to kind of unwind programs once they're stood up because they, they tend to get a fairly large and sophisticated constituency that knows how to sort of rig uh, the lobbying game. And so I, I'm, I, you know, I wish I had better news, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty pessimistic about the future of this stuff right now. And I'll, uh, and I'll piggyback and go one step further. I mean, you know, Clark mentioned that most farmers didn't want a trade war. Um, you know, if you talk to any farmers, the last thing they want is to have their income be dependent on, you know, government programs. Um, you know, there's, there's no farmer who says, oh, you know, I, I want to go and uh, I want to get all my money in the form of government subsidies. Um, and, and unfortunately, in the, in the current environment, I mean, I think, you know, Josh Sewell at, at Taxpayers for Common Sense 
um, you know, crunched the numbers recently and basically found that this year, I think it's somewhere between 50 and 75% of all farm income is going to be coming from government sources. That's yeah. hugely problematic. Uh, and frankly, it's not sustainable, uh, both from a sort of overall federal budget standpoint, um, but also, you know, from a, from a, just a, the agricultural sector standpoint, I mean, that's a, you know, we all know how central planning worked out for, uh, for the Soviet Union. And, and it's, uh, it's not exactly something that we want to be, uh, um, I think, uh, you know, transferring, to transferring here. And, I, and frankly, I, I think the people who, who want it least of all um, are farmers. But uh, unfortunately, uh, many of them don't know what to do. Um, and, you know, they don't control trade policy and they don't control um, you know, ag policy. And so um, it becomes, it, you know, it, it's sort of a, you know, you need it to survive, even if they fully recognize that the hardship that they're facing is, is to a significant degree uh, being impacted adversely by, by uh, governmental actions outside their control. And it, it's, it's, it's to kind of go one step further, um, this, is, this is endemic in all of these sort of protectionist schemes, right? Um, when you protect an industry from competition through subsidies or tariffs or whatever, they tend to not be as competitive long term. Um, and, and you know, it's it's the it's a market system that helps discipline them, that that makes them more innovative, that pushes forward. The United States is right now is a tremendous ag exporter, right? We about twenty percent of all of our stuff is, is shipped abroad because we can't consume all of it. Um, it, it, but but long term, you are going to sort of shackle the industry if it's so dependent on trade protectionism and and massive subsidies that it, it just not su subject to the rigors of, of market discipline. Um, and so that's that's one area where the U.S. does or traditionally has had a fairly strong comparative advantage in agriculture because we have such strong technology in the United States. We're we're really sophisticated in certain aspects, uh, but but even before all this started, the status quo wasn't really sustainable. And that was kind of the, the point of my paper, uh, the most recent paper, which is, which is basically that, yes, Trump has done all these bad things with respect to trade, and we need to sort of discipline those. Uh, but, but the status quo was broken before. And how do you get sort of two-step process, right? How do we unwind what Trump's done? And then that gets us back to the 2017 status quo, but then how do you get back to, to sort of a more forward-looking agriculture policy that's, you know, better for the environment, less costly for taxpayers, and more globally competitive? Um, and, and, you know, it just, it is frustrating because this, the most recent actions have added another hurdle um, that, that sort of those of us that want a lot of reform in the ag sector will have to overcome to, to then get back to where fighting those long-term fights that I think are, are necessary for the long-term competitiveness and stability of, of the U.S. ag industry. And I'll go one step further and just say from the standpoint of the of costs, um, it's important, you know, it's it's very easy to focus on sort of the on, you know, budget, uh, you know, numbers, but there are a whole host of costs that are imposed by these bad policies that even if you don't necessarily care about ag policy specifically, um, maybe you care about pollution, um, right? Like these, these policies create an undue amount of pollution, water pollution, and otherwise that may not otherwise occur. That's hugely problematic. Maybe you care about the well-being of people in other countries. Well, I mean, you know, the fact that we are we are heavily subsidizing uh, is this industry unnecessarily. It also harms farmers in other parts of the world, uh, which is hugely problematic. And then, of course, we turn around and provide foreign aid to these areas. Um, and so, you know, we we sort of create problems that we don't always, you know, think through the. Um, you know, the, the unintended consequences. And sometimes we know what they are and just don't care. And that's unfortunate too. But um, there are a whole host of costs beyond even just the, just the on budgetary costs that we often don't consider. Yeah. Clark, I, I know in your paper, um, you, you touched on the impact that our subsidies have on foreign markets abroad and on prospects for trade liberalization, with, which Jonathan just mentioned. Do you want to provide some perspective on that? Sure. Yeah. Um, look, our, our subsidies are essentially non-tariff barriers. Um, subsidies depress U.S. prices, uh, making foreign products less competitive in the United States. And, and getting to, to Jonathan's point, if you, if you think about this, um, there are a lot of subsistence farmer, farmers around the world or people that would really benefit from reaching the largest, wealthiest market in the world by sending their products here. 
uh, but they're, they can't compete against American produced stuff in this market because of our massive subsidy system. I mean, you know, Jonathan talks about that. I mean, a perfect example is the Brazil cotton case. The United States provided trade distorting subsidies to cotton forever. Brazil took the case that the WTO sued us, won. The United States, instead of removing the offending subsidies, basically said, here's money, Brazil, take a hundred million dollars or whatever the payout is, and then we will continue to subsidize our products. Just, and, and so we're basically paying twice. Um, and it, in a market system, right, we wouldn't have paid the subsidies. We would have re removed the offending measure. And the United States, getting again, sort of technical in, in the trade space, the United States wants to go out and claim the mantle of a defender of the great you know, rules-based trading system, but that's a case where the United, a situation where the United States lost a case at the WTO and basically flouted the ruling and said, that's fine, like you can rule that way. We're not going to remove the offending measure. We're just gonna pay the other person off or pay the other country off. Um, and now the United States you know, wants to go out or I'm, I'm, I routinely urge policymakers to litigate cases at the WTO if you have serious concerns rather than taking unilateral tariff actions. Um, but you know, the United States, that, that hurt the United States reputation globally um, but, but yeah, look, these products or these subsidies tend to screw over, screw up our, our markets. Um, and and if, if you look back at our history, right, the United States, right after 9-11, um, in sort of a show of solidarity, the United States was pushing all these countries at, at the WTO to launch a multilateral trade round to negotiate what was dubbed the Doha Development Round. And the Doha Round uh, the idea was to bring down agriculture subsidies in particular, bring down agriculture protectionisms, whether it be subsidies or tariffs. And the idea was to use trade to benefit sort of developing countries, right? P poorer countries, the, the type of farmers that Jonathan was just talking about. And as the United States was negotiating this, it became apparent that the United States and the EU, two of the wealthiest WTO members, could not get their own subsidy house in order, right? President Bush in 2008 signed a massive farm bill. And that signaled to other countries that the United States was not serious about getting its own subsidy house in order. And so why should, why should the two wealthiest members have the freedom to subsidize the hell out of agriculture? And then the United States sort of lectures other countries, India in particular, about its own protectionism in the ag space. So, all of this is to say that the United States went through a long process of negotiating the Doha development round. Doha essentially broke down uh, over ag subsidies and ag tariffs, and, and to the great detriment of developing countries, by the way, it also was sort of a black eye on the reputation of the United States in the sense that it, this was the first major either GATT, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, and then the subsequent WTO. This was the first multilateral trade round that was, that was never ratified. It, it was, that was launched and they just, countries just couldn't complete it. And it, again, a lot of the blame lies in Congress and, and in their inability to discipline farm subsidies. And so that would have just, it not only would it have helped developing countries, the United States would have seen massive market opening all across the world, lowering tariffs and other countries' subsidies. Um, and farmers, if, if you accept Jonathan's premise, and I do, that farmers would prefer market access to subsidies and protectionism, um, the Doha round would have been tremendous. And again, it, it, it just broke down because of our own inability to get serious about cutting the, the welfare state for agriculture. Now let's quickly turn to the pandemic and the problems that farmers are facing in addition to all the issues with trade, in addition to the issues with the traditional farm safety net. Um, what have taxpayers done so far to support farmers specifically that have been impacted by the pandemic and the economic fallout? Sure. So yeah, we, we talked a little bit about the, uh, uh, you know, the payments so far through CCC, um, which is, uh, you know, not insignificant. I think um, I think the interesting thing is, you know, what is being proposed going forward, which is, um, you know, pretty, pretty disconcerting. I mean, there are, um, uh, 
you know, about a month ago, there have been discussions talking about, uh, you know, what what should you know be in the next round of of COVID relief uh, in the farm space. And uh, there's of course disagreement here, like always. But the big thing that's been on the table there is is taking what we've done up to this point um, and making it making it permanent. Um, and you know, we talked about some of the problems that occur both from an accountability standpoint as well as a budget standpoint. Um, and so there's probably going to be some level of a battle over that going forward. Um, I think, you know, the other question here is, you know, there's a, there's a broader question of how do we deal with emergencies like this more generally. And I think that that is kind of the, um, it, it's, it's the, the, the big elephant in the room that no one is really, really talking about, or at least to the degree that they should be. Um, you know, post 9-11, the, the country as a whole I think conceptualize that the biggest threat or the biggest potential threat to our well-being was, you know, a national security existential event, right? Some sort of further terrorist attack or other, um, you know, other uh, wars, whether it's, you know, in the, in, uh, with, with a great power or with a rogue state. Um, and I think what the pandemic has brought to light is this idea that well, actually, there are a lot of potential existential threats that exist uh, with respect to the United States. Um, it may be national security related. It may be pandemic related. It may be environmental or you know, natural disaster related. And so um, I think there's this broader question about um, you know, how can the federal government properly prepare for these sorts of things. And historically, what we've basically done is said, you know, we're going to try to identify this problem and then we're going to appropriate a whole bunch of money toward it and hope that that solves it. And the problem with that methodology is that then when something unexpected arises, uh, you don't really have, you know, the infrastructure, the, the, the governmental infrastructure in place to theoretically deal with it. Um, and, and so, you know, there's, I think, this, this question about how can we be more flexible, um, you know, and, and preparing for these sorts of things in the future. Um, and frankly, not blowing out the federal budget uh, to do it. I mean, you know, one of the big problems that we've seen with COVID up to this point is that, you know, everyone kind of comes and says, I have experienced a harm, there needs to be aid provided to me. And, and those claims are, I think, in, it, you know, absolutely legitimate, particularly when you're talking about, um, you know, an existential uh, uh, crisis that was not caused by any sort of uh, actions by, um, you know, by private individuals or, or companies. Um, but that doesn't change the fact that there's a substantial impact on the federal budget. And I think, um, you know, in the, in the agriculture space, this, this, is, this is playing out on perhaps a little bit more micro level of the whole, the whole federal budget, but the phenomenon is the exact same. And, uh, um, and the, the path that we're on because of the actions that we've taken in response to COVID up to this point um, really isn't the one that we want to be on. Um, and it's certainly not sustainable um, you know, over the medium to long term, nor, as I argued earlier, is it really appropriate, uh, particularly if we get past the current, the current problem. So, um, so there's this, there's this broader question about, you know, how, how should we deal with emergency type spending in the future? Yeah, I, I would, I would add that um, sort of on a concrete basis, uh, COVID, back in January, the United States and China uh, signed the so-called phase one deal. And, as part of that, the United States basically told Beijing, you need to buy X number of dollars of American exports. And um, as of now, the, the administration was set to have what was known as sort of the phase one, the first phase one review over the weekend. Um, and the Trump administration and USTR sort of called that off. Um, and, and basically what it was, was to see if, sort of where China stood on, on making these changes that it committed itself to making in, in January. Um, and, and as part of that, um, the United States set an aggressive target of, of about $40 billion worth of ag product purchases from the United States this year. And as of Ju uh, June, the most recent figures we have, they're only at eight to $10 billion on, on track. So, and I, th I think part of that is the COVID situation has slowed down the world economy. Um, and so maybe there's not as much demand, X, Y, and Z, all of that. Um, but, but again, it, it's, that's the problem, right? When the United States forced China to meet a specific target that's sort of separate from broader considerations, macroeconomic considerations, 
um, it made it exceedingly more difficult for China to, to meet those targets once COVID hit. Um, and, and on top of that, at, the way China is purchasing a lot of these products is through um, what are known as state-owned enterprises. Essentially, uh, and part of the, the U.S. complaint about China and Chinese commercial practices is that they don't operate on market-oriented terms, that they're just so heavily subsidized or completely controlled by uh, the central government in Beijing that they're not market, it's, it's unfair competition to American uh, firms. And so what we've done is we've made them more reliant um, on these state-owned enterprises that can basically just say, fine, purchase this amount of soy, irrespective of whether or not there's any demand for American soy. You're forcing them to buy it. And, and again, they're, they're using these entities that the United States has long complained about. So in other words, it just further entrenches a sort of broken system that I think a lot of trade folks, trade wonks, trade lawyers, um, think it is is completely messed up, uh, but but now they're they're more reliant on that system. So um, yeah, I, I think that long term um, this is this poses problems, but I, I do think that the the COVID situation has hurt China's ability to meet its purchase targets. I want to save some time for questions that have come in from the audience. So I guess I'll just ask you one more quick question and then we'll turn to the questions that all of you have asked. Um, so if anyone else has questions, Q&A box is open, feel free to put them in there. I guess my last question is, um, obviously eliminating tariffs and eliminating subsidies isn't politically feasible, nor would it be expedient. Probably we know that you know farmers are struggling from the pandemic, from the trade issues, and just because farming is a hard job. Um, what, what solutions would you propose, both short-term and long-term, to sort of inject more market forces in the ag economy and address some of these issues? Jonathan? Yeah, I'll, I'll mention a couple, a couple things that come to mind, um, one sort of micro and one macro. Um, you know, Clark mentioned some, some earlier that I think were, were great ideas. I think, you know, the, everyone kind of has their favorite little, uh, little example that gets your goat a little bit. You know, mine, it was is, you know, we hear the stories all the time about people in you know, New York City, for example, who are not farmers, who are getting access to, um, to aid that is meant for farmers. Um, I think that's hugely problematic. And, um, you know, obviously they are associated with a farming business and that's why they are, are able to qualify. Um, but, you know, that doesn't pass the sniff test. It doesn't really pass common sense to me. And I think there are things like that that even if you don't necessarily agree with me or agree with Clark on sort of what the optimal level of, of support to the agriculture uh, industry and economy should be, um, we should acknowledge that these kinds of things should be rooted out and, and the program should be structured in ways that are, that are better. Um, so, you know, are you gonna get rid of all of subsidies? No, but I think, you know, we all acknowledge that there are specific things like this that, um, that you know, can be, can be um, structural improvements, um, you know, all, all subsidies, all programs are not equally bad or equally good. There are better ways and that's what policy is all about and that's that, that we should think about. Um, on the macro front, I will say that, you know, when you think about the federal budget, um, I think the other thing is just, you know, getting people to demand offsets more, more often. Um, you know, right now we have this attitude and, you know, that we just sort of increasingly um, uh, you know, provide funding via emergency supplementals and via, um, uh, just off budget mechanisms. And, um, you know, that's hugely problematic. That's not the way that I mean, you know, and, and, and this is not, by the way, unique at all to the agriculture spending space. I mean, if you think about the way we've handled natural disasters, um, you know, that's sort of the way it always happens. A flood happens here. Oh, Congress appropriates X billion dollars more. A hurricane happens there. We appropriate X billion dollars more. Um, and regardless of whether or not that aid is appropriate, um, the process that we're following is not appropriate. Um, and so um, that, that phenomenon needs to change. And I think the same thing is true in the ag space. And one way to do that um, is to just say that, you know, to the degree that the federal government decides that something is a worthwhile expense for them to undertake, um, there should be a demand for offsets um, to be able to pay for that. Um, and in fact, I would argue that if you believe strongly in the need for a program or for a specific item of spending, um, you should argue even more strongly for offsets because that shows that you believe it's so important that you know we should identify offsets for it. Um, uh, you know, sometimes as difficult as that may be. And so, um, so I think there's sort of a there are these micro reforms that we can certainly make. 
Um, and then there's just this broader question um, about how we conceptually think about um, think about the the various federal programs that we have, um, you know, in ag and in many areas. And uh, and to the degree that we at least start to go and pay for these programs legitimately from a from a budgetary standpoint, um, you know, then we can have the fight afterwards about whether or not this spending makes sense. But let's at least acknowledge up front that we should account for the the budgetary um, the budgetary cost. Yeah, I, I would probably also bifurcate this answer in the sense that I think in the short term, um, it, it might not be possible to eliminate all uh, recently enacted tariffs, um, but I do think that we can eliminate some. I, I know uh, Vice President Biden has talked about that as a campaign issue. Um, and so I, I do think that we can eliminate some of them. And then as a result, you can start to bring down some of these subsidy payments. Um, I think that you know the subsidy payments make maybe made sense in in light of COVID, um, or they they made sense in in the trade context. But we really need to make these temporary. They cannot and should not become part of the ongoing baseline uh, that that essentially just gets built in, not only sort of built in from a cost perspective um, into the next farm bill, but also as Jonathan mentioned at the beginning of this, uh, there are sort of legitimate constitutional and structure of government issues with, with these, the way these payments are, are set up in the sense that they're not, right? So it's just sort of a blank check and, and you give this agency, uh, the Commodity Credit Corporation within Treasury, but sort of funded through uh, the USDA, um, sort of discretionary authority, this sort of slush fund to, to hand out to um, favored constituencies. So I, I do think that avoiding that as, as a baseline going forward is, is a good idea in, in keeping these things, um, understanding that the, they were temporary measures that were done in, in really extraordinary circumstances. Um, so removing some of that gets us back to that 2017 status quo, which I think was better than where we are now. But long term, I, I do think that, that, you know, the U.S. has enormous comparative advantage in agriculture. Um, and we should be exploiting that. But to do that, especially in a multilateral forum like the World Trade Organization, the U.S. has to be willing to make, we don't have to eliminate all of our subsidies, right? Nobody's asking us to do that, but we do need to make a credible commitment that, the, that there's a the firm cap on how much we're going to spend every year, and we're not going to engage in really heavy trade distorting subsidies like export subsidies that, that can only be triggered on the export of a product, for instance. Um, those sort of good faith measures um, that the U.S. could take would, would pay enormous dividends over the long term. And again, our, our own ability to discipline farm subsidies is the biggest chip that we have to play to get other countries to drop their protectionist barriers. So I think, again, it's sort of a short term, get back to that 2017 status quo, and then from there, how do you look sort of fight this fight long term. And I think the longer term fight is, is more valuable, but I also think it, it's a harder lift, right? Because of the entrenched interests that love the sort of status quo farm safety net. Great, so we have a question from Eric Haar. Uh, Jonathan, you already covered this a little bit, but maybe you could put a fine point on it. Eric asks, how do libertarians and other fiscal conservatives recognize a reconcile a desire to support farmers, ranchers, renewable fuels, and food supply while not perpetuating subsidies and putting the taxpayer at risk? Yeah, um, so I think there are, there are a couple things. One is um, this distinction between temporary and permanent, I think is very important. Um, and that's something that I've emphasized, you know, broadly speaking in the context of the current COVID crisis. Um, you know, you can acknowledge, I mean, people like to make the comparison between 2008 and, and right now, and those are actually very different events because the, the harms that were imposed in 2008 were largely due to a governmental action, but also, um, you know, undue risk that was being taken by private sector actors. And so um, the idea of the federal government getting involved in that situation is very different than getting involved in the current situation, uh, which is sort of a, a completely exogenous shock. Um, but I think the key thing is ensuring that you're not expanding existing programs and you're keeping any relief focused explicitly on 
uh, harms due to the problem at hand. Uh, and that's where, you know, I think we've, we've run a file, we've started to run a foul of that because as soon as you start to provide any sort of federal relief, um, you know, everyone sort of, you know, comes out of the woodwork to make it, to make a claim. Uh, and it, it oftentimes can drown out the legitimate ones. So, um, you know, that's the first thing. And the second thing I think is, is what we've talked about earlier about, you know, recognizing that the programs that they, as they exist currently are largely serving as conduits to funnel money to large businesses that may not need that, that safety net nearly as much as the small family farmer. Um, and so, you know, trying to make reforms that, um, you know, make sure that, that to the degree that the safety net exists, it's actually going to the people that it's meant to help, um, you know, is, is a positive, I think, a positive step as well. Yeah, I, I, I would add, you know, you, you, you can sort of target means test some of these subsidies, a lot of things like that. Um, I don't want to get into all the concrete proposals that are out there, the Affirm Act, the bar, you know, various proposals, but, but just conceptually, I think most important thing is thinking through, like, like the GAO, for instance, put out a report a couple of years ago that said, if you just make marginal changes to the crop insurance program, for instance, um, you would, it wouldn't really impact uh, much in terms of coverage and all of that, but it, you could better target the subsidies to those who really need them. And it, again, it just gets into something that R Street in particular, Caroline has written a lot about this, that, that the farm safety net really isn't much of a farm safety net in the sense that it misses, it's totally misaligned, right? It, it, it's the people who benefit most are very wealthy agribusinesses and it just becomes a form of corporate welfare as opposed to a well-intentioned, well-designed uh, safety net, sort of a baseline for people who really need it because there are farmers and ranchers who need these products. Um, they may not be able to afford uh, a totally private sector solution, so they need some sort of government subsidy. And, and I, I, I get it, the, the risks are enormous um, in the ag space uh, because it's, you know, it's not like me sitting in my house on my computer all day, it's, it's, you're dependent on weather, what foreign markets are doing, a whole host of issues. Um, and so again, th there is a need for, for some of these products, but it, it, they need to be better targeted to those who really need them and not ultra sophisticated, ultra wealthy corporations, agri corporations. Um, and, and I think that, that that's a good first step, just conceptually thinking about it like that. Definitely, and I think that dovetails nicely into the last question that we have time for today. So apologies if we couldn't get to everyone's questions, but Matt Russell asks, what reforms in the crop insurance space would move the industry away from reliance on the government? Um, Clark mentioned some of those. I'll, I'll briefly touch on that too. Um, currently, the federal government subsidizes on average 62% of government of farmers' crop insurance premiums, and that's regardless of the size of the operation, you could easily scale that back. There was a proposal during the last farm bill cycle to scale that back to around 45%. Um, that would be a meaningful way. Also, the government guarantees, I think, a 14.5% rate of return for insurance companies. There have been proposals to scale that back maybe to 11, 12%, still generous but a good right. way to find savings and to, you know, encourage farmers to have more skin in the game. And then obviously the, the reforms that have been mentioned, mean testing, means testing crop insurance, putting a payment limit in place. There's no reason why a single agribusiness needs to be getting more than a million dollars in subsidies from taxpayers. That's just ridiculous. And you could easily put, in, put a meaningful scope around the crop insurance program. Perfect. I, I completely agree with all that. Same. I think you could even go and limit the limit which crops are, are eligible, right? If I if I recall, I think it's uh, in the last forty years there's been a tripling of which crops are eligible for crop insurance. Which, uh, uh, you know, something like that should probably be reassessed at some point as well. Yeah. Definitely. Well, I think we're out of time for today, but thank you, Clark and Jonathan, for your expert expert advice here. Uh, thanks to all the panelists. Thanks to all the participants for joining us. If you have any questions about this, don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, always happy to talk more about this and hope everyone enjoys the rest of their August. Thanks. Thank yeah. you.